first. Uh, you know, it's so funny. It feels like, you know, I spoke at the NBS uh, National Convention on a panel in Los Angeles, uh, which was literally just, what, two months ago, right? Something yeah. like that. It's so weird because it was on a Thursday afternoon. I think it might have been Thursday the 12th. And that Friday the 13th was essentially the beginning of what has now become the new normal. And I remember like semi addressing, you know, what the challenges were going to be for the industry potentially going forward on that panel, never knowing that we'd be in, you know, two months later, the life as we know it has completely changed. Yeah, it's amazing how different it is. And um, one of the things that I was thinking about asking you is that I know a lot of our students um, were signed up to have internships for the spring yeah. and summer, and a lot of those got canceled. Do you have any advice for students who might find themselves in that situation? Do you have any ideas of what they should do to uh, keep those connections going? Well, you know, we're dealing with this in sort of real time right now as well. You know, I work for Live Nation Corporation, hence the concert scene in the background. Um, but Live Nation Productions is the division that we have, you know, as a division of Live Nation. And it's a rather newer group. And we do both film and television, scripted and unscripted. And all of our projects lean into the music space in some way. And we can get into that more. But bottom line is both Live Nation as a corporation and Live Nation Productions, our division, have interns. And one of the things that we had to do was basically say, hey, guys, your semester is ending, you know, uh, sooner than expected. Um, and these are sort of the challenges we have. Now we have, you know, fall coming up. And there's so many unanswered questions, I think, from the 30,000 foot view down to like the one inch view. And we're sort of all playing this out in real time. And I think an example of that is, you know, do universities, and these are way all above my pay grade, but, you know, do universities actually start up in the fall? Um, and what happens if they don't, right? Well, that's sort of the same situation for uh, places of employment, right? If you're a small production company or a really large studio or a large multinational, multi-billion dollar corporation like Live Nation, what do you do? Are we all gonna come late summer, fall, physically be back in the office? In which case, if we are, I think interns will be back in the office as well, right? Because then at that point, we've set up certain health checks and things like that for people to return to the office safely. But if we don't, and this is sort of the crux of your question, what do we do because I was an intern at one point in time and it, the internships are such valuable things. I'm hoping, and I don't have the answer, and I think it's gonna be a case by case basis, that like um, we're doing these, hopefully technology will help us in some way, right? So um, for example, maybe we do uh, virtual internships, right? Like our division is still continuing. Our work is still continuing. Our, we're still reading scripts. We're still writing coverage. We're still analyzing projects. Maybe again, depending on the company, inter you know, students can still be in front of their computers. They can still read scripts, just like writers can still write. They can still write coverages. And then maybe just like my team, when we do meetings like this via Zoom multiple times a week, maybe we do the same thing with the interns or they become part of those meetings just virtually. I, it's a long way of saying we don't know, but I think that technology will actually help us because I think internships are so valuable and it would really be a shame if we had to cancel them, you know, altogether. I th and then, then I think the final thing is, it also depends on companies because a lot of times interns these days have to be paid, like whether it be a stipend or a very nominal amount of money. And then you get into the question of, if you're a small production company and you're analyzing your costs and cash rate per month, is that something you can actually afford? So there's a myriad of challenges with it, but I, I do think, um, I think in, my advice would be for students, keep applying for the internships, keep reaching out to people, keep doing everything you would normally be doing, and then it will just be up to the employers and the companies to decide how they're gonna do it. So Matt, um, for those who might hear this, who are 
creative people. What encouragement do you have to uh, maybe a future writer or a yeah. creative uh, who might listen to this? Do you think that during this free time when they're not in school, um, they're not doing the things that they normally do, should they be writing? And how do they stay creative? I think that's exactly right. You know, I'm dealing with writers on a daily basis right now for both, you know, scripted film and television. And, you know, everyone has their challenges, right? You know, some writers who are, you know, married with kids aren't used to actually having, you know, their, their kids go off to school and, you know, they can write in the confines of their house during the day. So, you know, on a lighter note, all writing is getting done, but a few of them, you know, have like the kids coming in and asking for their milk and juice boxes in the middle of a, like a brainstorm or something like that. These are just the normal challenges that we all have no matter what our career is. But the great thing is if you are creative, there's ways you can get creative during quarantine, right? So the easiest is writing because you can just sit in front of your laptop or your desktop or your pen to paper or whatever you do, and you can still write, you know? And, and that's a really, really great thing. And then different people have been using different techniques to help them get through it, right? That could be daily walks, that could be apartment exercise. There's different ways to still get inspired, but writing is still writing in your room listening to music, whatever your methodology is. Directing obviously becomes a little bit more of a challenge, but I've seen some, as well, I'm sure we all have, some really creative short films that are like life in the time of sub-corona, quarantine stories, you know, whatever you want to call them, that are either like mini documentaries, short films, comedy to horror to thriller. There's a lot going up on YouTube right now. I think you can still flex that muscle. And in a weird way, it's, it's, uh, it's harnessing the spirit of like, independent filmmaking again where people can just take their iphone and you know make these little short films if you're quarantined with someone you have the addition of a teammate if you don't if you're not quarantined you know with anyone then you basically you know create you know do it do it yourself you know i've even seen people like do like little like stop motion things you know almost like when, when you know you have a lot more time on your hands so the painstaking process of slowly moving things frame by frame you know claymation action figures you know all of that type of stuff you can have a lot of fun with that and then i think you know the hardest things obviously are producing because at the end of the day, you know, like producing usually involves a lot of people. So for me as a producer, you know, my goals are reading the drafts that my writers are writing, giving them notes, critiquing work, and doing everything that a producer does in development, because that's really the only thing we can do because production has, has stopped for the time being. So it's really taking a deep dive into the creative and making sure that the pieces that our writers are writing are really good. So I think in challenging times, long story short, creativity has the ability to get even better, whether it be on the page, or short films or something like that. But for creative people, they'll find the outlet. So um, I, I know that when you uh, stop going to school and stop doing the regular things that you do, you're like, wow, I have all this time. I'm gonna do all these things, but it's really hard to stay focused. So uh, just uh, like the students as a professional, how have you been staying focused? And do you have a daily routine and any advice about creating one? Yeah, it's actually most of the advice I'm now going to give, I've gotten from other people as well. So I'm doing a little passing it along, paying it forward or whatever. And then some of it is a mixture of my own as well. Someone, I'm a movie guy. So some, um, some of my comparisons are going to be two movies and then you sort of make it your, your own thing. And someone described this to me as we're all a version of Matt Damon in The Martian right now. And if you remember that movie, you know, or the book before it, um, he was stuck on Mars. He was in his bubble. He had to wait for that ship to get to him. The countdown was on. The days were ticking down and he had to just survive mentally, physically, et cetera. And he, if you remember, he was growing his potatoes in the movie and there were challenges with that as well. So I would say to a certain degree, we're all the Martian and we're all growing our potatoes and whatever version of potatoes you guys have, 
that's what you're doing, right? So it's the schedule. If you remember in the movie, he was like, okay, I've got to, I'm gonna figure out what time of the day it is. I'm gonna plan my wake ups and my sleeps. I'm going to have a, 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 a much of a work schedule or day as you possibly can, right? So for me, I still set an alarm, I get up, I, you know, depending on the day, I'm either jumping right into coffee and work. Other times it's slower in the morning. So I'm trying to do a little exercise. I'm figuring out, okay, when is my daily walk? We're, we're all fortunate on like the Martian that we can go outside without a space suit. So, you know, we can go outside, like get your walks, get your fresh air, do your apartment or house, you know, or yard work slash exercise. Um, Get, do your to-do list. I find to-do lists are really important and they're long-term and short-term, right? So you can be like, you know, everything from, I'm finally going to finish writing that script that I've always wanted to do, but I'm also going to organize that junk drawer in the kitchen as well that I have never gotten to. And I find that like doing those tasks that you normally never wouldn't get to, I actually weirdly put pressure on myself where I'm like, I don't finish all of those stupid little tasks that I've been wanting to do for the longest time. By the time this lifts, uh, I'm never going to get to it. So I would say it's scheduling, it's exercise, it's clearing the head, it's staying creative, it's um, you know even planning your grocery store shopping or whatever it is, you know, and making sure you're safe. All of these things, for me at least, are filling the day as much as you possibly can. So I, I would just go back to that Matt Damon uh, Martian analogy. And, and the biggest issue is for our industry, whether it be live music, film, television, scripted and non-scripted, it's a very social business. So that's the challenge for us. You know, there's so many breakfasts and lunches and dinners and drinks and coffees and collaboration on a human level both for the business and for the outlet. We can't go to live music concerts. We can't go to the movie theaters. We don't have that anymore. So those are the challenges for us. But obviously for streaming, we still have can watch movies and TV and get that fix as much as we possibly can. And just know that humanity is returning on the other side of this. So I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll see if the students have any questions. Sure, sure. As I hope you, help them. Yeah, as you imagine um, going back to work and transitioning back into the realities of what our daily lives were before all of this, what advice might you have for those students who will return to a professional production situation? Um, do we bring some of these new routines back to work with us or do we just try to snap back to where we were what are you thinking about well so so if you had a good routine before all of this such as the setting of the alarm such as balancing you know work and exercise and stuff and you're able to keep it during this then you should be able to go back to it if you're just learning it for the first time as a result of this situation then hopefully you'll keep those things going forward because whether you're in production or the business end or the legal end or whatever, finding a routine, no matter frankly what you do for work, but especially uh, in this business, it's actually a really good thing. The challenges we're going to have going forward, and there's countless, uh, and each one has a potential solution, but then each of those solutions that are put on the table also has a ripple effect of other challenges as well. So, you know, as one of my friends said to me the other night, he's like, everything and anything should be on the table right now for discussion because we've no one alive has ever faced this challenge before. So we just need to put it all on the table and, 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 and be able to discuss it, hopefully as rational human beings. You know, the problems for production, um, that no student on here is going to have to specifically solve, but these are the things that they have to think about going forward and these, were the, these will be the challenges, such as, and there's only just a few, what will film and television sets look like going forward? Will there be a reduction of the amount of people? Will there be a corona representative from the health department, almost like you at the higher police when you're shutting down locations? 
will those people then be, be in charge of making sure people have their masks and be socially distant when the crew usually has lunch at the same time, right? At each day for the most part, is it gonna become more like you're in high school and you have like periods of lunch, right? Staggered, maybe 25 people go to lunch to keep social distance at 11.30, the next group at 12.30, the next group at 1.30, are there temperature checks? Um, you know, how the script supervisor usually sits right next to the director for continuity purposes. Are they now maintaining that six foot thing? I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But the good news is none of your prior experience working on sets, whether they be student films, local commercials, PSAs, what have you, all of that same discipline and set hierarchy and jobs, all of those things are still going to exist. So it's not like you're throwing the tool book out the window. You're still using all those tools. You're still telling a story. You're still making a movie. The question is just going to be more logistical than anything else. And like anything, you know, film sets, I've been on a lot of them, they're dirty. You know, like you're playing, you're literally playing in the mud every day. So I think good hygiene is going to, you know, whether it be spraying down trucks or more hand sanitizer stations and wash stations, gloves. I mean, it's just going to be, uh, there's going to be a sea change with that type of thing, which is frankly probably for the better. The question, of course, becomes who's picking up the tab for all of those things. And that's, that's being discussed. All right. So um, do any of the students on here have a question for Matt? Anyone interested in uh, asking him a question? Just uh, unmute your mic and shout it out. And you can do video if you want to. I don't know yeah. if you're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see some, uh, yeah. some boxes up on screen here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Erin, do you have a question for Matt? Yes, I do. So I'm a senior currently and I graduate in the spring. Mm -hmm. So... I'm worried about going in production. Like I want to go in like film slash corporate video. And right now my internship is like very nice and they gave me all my stuff online. So I'm That's trying cool. to impress them as much as I can by doing the online stuff and sending it back to them. Do you have any advice for like me, especially like going out into the world, like next, it will be spring 2021. Right, right, right. Um, a few things. So the first thing I would say would be, you know, um, because it's more an online thing right now and you're, you're what are you like emailing assignments in or something like that? Uh, they gave me a hard drive and we're going back and forth. We're messaging. Okay, great. So the example of what I was talking about using technology to still be able to, um, you know, make things happen. So I would say, Weirdly, it's a version of the same advice I would give if you were still working in the office still, which is I always find um, a few things. One, going above and beyond, right? So like if they ask you to do X, do X plus one, but, uh, but also maintaining the fine line between persistence and annoyance, which, you know, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a in, in individual thing, sort of knowing your manager and knowing, you know, your coworkers. So yeah. I would say, do your job to the best of the ability, give it a little extra push above that and anticipate things ahead of time as much as you possibly can, right? So just because they're giving you one assignment, they probably will go, okay, you did this, but now do that. It would be amazing at one point if they said, okay, you did this, now do that. And you went, well, I actually did do that already because I thought you might ask about that, blah, blah, blah. And then as someone who's given these assignments before, you're like, whoa, whoa, this is what we're thinking. That's, that's amazing. And that's great. Now, don't do it to the point of like, you know, you're putting the apple on the desk every day. You know, that's the, that's the fine line between persistence and annoyance. But I do think um, there's a certain degree and it sort of weeds out a regular intern from like a superstar intern. And then maybe when hiring starts again, they'll go, that's someone I want on my team. And then the, my only other advice there would be 
Um, because you don't have the personal connection in the office anymore, maybe you can do one of those like, listen, I really appreciate the opportunity and I know it's really like crazy times, but if you can give me 15 minutes on a Friday or something like that, I have a few questions for you. Maybe we can do like a one-on-one -on -one or something like that. And again, you have to feel it out with whoever the manager is, but trying to get that individual attention during this time um, is important. And I think they're more apt to give it to you because A, people have more time and B, if you're doing a really good job, people will go, you know, this person is deserving of the extra 15 minutes or 30 minutes of a one-on-one, -on -one, if that sort of helps. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions for Matt? Do, you, do we talk about, are we talking about backgrounds at all? Like how we got into yeah, the business? Do you want to um, just uh, step back a little bit and just tell us your story, how you got started. And um, I know you have so many accomplishments, but maybe some of your uh, greatest accomplishments um, as, a, as a producer. Yeah, I mean, the, the quick story is, um, you know, this is the third, I've been doing this for a while. Scott and I know each other from college uh, many years ago and, uh, and, and, and maintained a, a close friendship. And, um, you know, I went to school at University of Miami. After I graduated, I went back to New Jersey and I had done internships in New York City. And where I grew up, you can take the train into New York. And I did one between my sophomore and junior year and junior and senior year. I will also work in summer jobs and stuff like that as well. And when I graduated, I remember calling upon, you know, the companies I worked for to go, you know, are there any jobs available? And there weren't. And so, you know, what I always tell people is use your six degrees of separation, uh, walk that fine line between persistence and annoyance, and then figure out how you're going to parlay that into like your first gig. And I always tell people, just get your foot in the door. It does it, the first gig is not going to be the thing you're going to be doing for the rest of your career. Just get your foot in the door. So my very first job ever paid out of college was a receptionist. And, you know, being a receptionist was not something I thought, okay, I went to four years of college and, you know, money, time, and, uh, you know, blood, sweat, and tears for, you know, making sure I'm sorting the mail, answering the phones, and making sure milk is there for the executive's coffee. But someone is going to do that. And they're going to be the ones that are going to then be looked on to, like, take the next jump. And there's a line out the door for people actually who will want to do that. So I took that gig and I was at Miramax Films, which at the time was, you know, the powerhouse in New York City, um, located in lower Manhattan in Tribeca. And so I was a receptionist there. And I wound up spending 13 years at that company, which is pretty crazy. And, you know, grew from literally being a receptionist to living sort of the male version of the Devil Wears Prada, um, where, you know, I was an assistant to one of the co-chairmen for four years, two years as his second and two years as his first, and then grew through the company to running production for Dimension Films, which is the genre division of the studio where we were doing, you know, a bunch of franchise movies, Spy Kids, Scary Movie, Screams, Halloweens, Piranha, Stephen King movies like The Mist and 1408. Um, and it was a great run. And I got to like be in the trenches on both the production side and creative side. And I'm, I'm condensing all of this. And then I'm, well, after 13 years there and living in New York and working there, I moved to LA and I produced some movies independently. And then I went to work at Sony in their international productions group. And I was there for two, two years, went into a producing deal, which led me to a few months in London working on this Nick Frost, Simon Pegg movie for Sony International. And then got the call from Live Nation that they were starting sort of a scripted film and TV division uh, that leans into music. And they had an investment, an equity investment in this movie, A Star Is Born, that no one thought was gonna be the phenomenon that it became. Um, so that sort of helped us launch our scripted division. And now we're actually developing film and television, both unscripted and scripted. So documentaries, film and television uh, within Live Nation. Um, and that's sort of what we're doing right now. So it's, it's a combination of um, wearing both hats of being both a buyer and a seller 
and uh, a, a, both a producer and an executive. And so I'd like to think that all of my years have sort of led to this moment. And it's a cool little entrepreneurial unit within the bigger uh, company of Live Nation. Uh, that was a very, very quick version of it all, but that was the, that's more or less been my, I have to take a breath when I say this, 20 years of, uh, <laughs> of doing this, which is crazy. And, and Matt was an NBS member at the University of Miami with me. Um, and I think that uh, those relationships that you make within your chapter and at your school are really important. And we've maintained our friendship even really before we were NBS members and we're totally. in a TV studio. Um, so Matt really and I were literally at an NBS national convention in New York uh, our yes. senior year. Yep, yep. Yeah, in, yeah. in 1999. Yeah, now, which is more than 20 years ago. I wasn't so, exactly dated, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, it's really great to have you on the call. Thanks. Joe or Jim, do you have any questions for Matt? Yeah, Matt, I, um, I guess one question would be, uh, I, and this might be some crystal ball gazing. Sure, sure. Um, what changes do you feel we might be seeing um, <clears throat> In the in the film industry, especially with the theatrical films, the feature films, um, in in releases, distribution, uh, or production. It's a great question, and it's something that is morphing like everything I'm talking about on a daily basis right now. I mean, what you're seeing is, let's use um, the Trolls movie from Universal, uh, which just dropped to digital, right? So. A lot of parents and probably Scott included are loving that because then there's like brand new movies that the kids can love because they can't go to movie theaters in their home, which is really, really fantastic, right? Now there are pros and cons to all of this from the studio perspective and not to go too far into the weeds on it, but long, for, long story short, people are going, okay, there might be a project that at the end of the day to release a movie theatrical the production budget is X, then the marketing budget is Y, which could be even more than the production budget to release it theatrically. So then they're going, okay, well, I can either make a deal with a streamer on Netflix and Amazon, et cetera, and do, run my P&Ls and see if that's the best methodology for it. Or they might be actually producing from scratch right now with an eye towards just going to a streamer to begin with and never contemplating theatrical. Or you could just make it and go, okay, at the end of the day, I'll see how it turns out. And then I have the choice of going streaming or theatrical. And then finally, you have this issue of, uh, there's a few more things, but basically the, there's the issue of um, windows, right? And a lot of exhibitors who are in trouble right now, so we're talking about AMC and Regal and Cinemark for the, the biggest changes, they usually require a window of time that there's exclusive in the theater before it hits the first streaming or pay TV or whatever your windows are beyond that, right? A lot of the studios right now are just gonna go, listen, I know that was the rule before and that was the deal that we made. It's time to renegotiate because, you know, maybe the Avengers or James Bond gets like a four week theatrical window and something else might get a two week theatrical window, you know, because we don't know what is going to happen on the other side of this. I mean, another thing that has to be contemplated is, you know, if you, and all the studios have shifted their release dates, right? So for example, let's say you're a big giant $200 million production budget movie that doesn't even, even include marketing. You're also counting on um, screens in movie theaters all over the country and for that matter all over the world usually at max capacity seating level for each showing right so that can be 200 seats to 500 seats sometimes lesser sometimes more now in the in, in this day and age of corona if theaters open but when theaters open back up are you going to have a situation where you have to leave blank seats so does a 500 person theater come become a 250 person theater can you play as many shows around the clock? You know, usually they do a quick clean and then a turnaround. Maybe you have to sanitize the whole place so you have less showings. So that means your gross 
inevitably becomes less on the movie as well. So you have to contemplate your film rental, which is your returns back to the studio, potentially being less as well. So these are just a myriad of factors from theatrical to, you know, and then the final thing I would say is if you're a studio that also has a streamer, so let's look at Disney. Disney has now launched Disney Plus. So Disney within its own confines gets to say, okay, maybe this movie is now just going to go to exclusively to its own streamer. And the only place you can see it is you, you get a, a, a subscription to that, um, to that streamer. So in turn, we were seeing numbers already going up for people subscribing to the streamers because that's the only place to find certain material. And the more and more it's gonna force studios who don't have a streamer to contemplate potentially building their own pipeline and their own streamer as well so they can pump their own product out rather than making individual license deals with Netflix and Amazon who are also making their own material. So that's a, that's a really long answer, and some of it probably got in the weeds for some people on the call, but like, it's really fascinating. It's really crazy. Before all of this, all the rules were changing. Now they're definitely changing. The question is, how far will they pivot back when we come back? I suspect we'll pivot back to a certain degree, but not all the way. That's that's uh, great. I, I I appreciate the insights. One comment on the on the local front here: we have a second run theater in in my area, and they've already uh, gone public with the fact that the shows that they normally get in in their window, uh, they're they're going they're going directly to to stream. So uh, they they're already saying that when they reopen, they're going to be showing classic films. Um, and, and that's exactly, and I've heard this from a lot of people as well, is to go, okay, you're right, that window of second run could either be squashed down further or non-existent, like in the case you brought up. So it forces the local entrepreneur, the local programmer to go, I'm just going to show Gone with the Wind, you know, or whatever it is, because either maybe that's not available on the streamer, or people want to see something like that on the big screen, rather than their their you know, 45 inch TV or 50 inch TV at home. And I think Along I think with the wind was cool. one of the shows that was. <laughs> well, there you go. I, I, I picked the classic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's, that's good. Yeah. Well, Matt, this has been wonderful and I'm really thankful that you could join us today. Um, and I hope that uh, we'll have uh, more time with you in the future when we have another convention out in LA. Please do. I look forward to uh, humanity returning and actually speaking to people uh, directly face to face. That'll be great. And whether, you know, the students on the call are hearing this or they hear it on playback, hopefully this was informative and I hope the rest of your speakers are as well. And just know we will get beyond this and we're going to need bright young people like all of you on the phone to come up with not only solutions, but it, it's a story driven business. So at the end of the day, it's still story, story, story. We'll get through all the technicalities of it and the business of it and the health and safety of it but we just need great stories to tell and um you be sometimes in the, in the time of adversity great stories are born so just good luck to you all <laughs>